welcome to episode six of the Beach Boys podcast. We have Nate and Brandon here today, and uh, it's going to be a smaller episode, but we're going to dive into Brian Wilson's solo discography. We're going to go through each album in order, talk about, uh, you know, some stuff that we like about it, some of the backstory leading into the album. And this one's going to be kind of long. We're probably going to have to break this one up into two parts, but i um, excited to do this. I love Brian's solo stuff, and I appreciate you guys being here. How are you guys doing today? Good, thank you. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. So we are going to start out with Brian's first album from 1988, the self-titled album. Um, what are your guys' initial thoughts on um, this album and how Brian was at this point in his life leading up to this album? Great writing, great arranging, interesting production, uh, stressful singing. That's a good <laughs> Um I think... Uh, I think it's good. Like, I, I mean, it's a, it's a good solid debut. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it would have been disappointing, very disappointing if a Brian Wilson debut was anything less than that. Um, but it, it, it's interesting. It's kind of like they, um, they, in terms of the, vo the vocals, like the vocals, like people, people, some people complain about the production on the album, like say, oh, you've got these great songs here. I'd like the album if it wasn't for the production. And then I'm like, no, like the production's great. Like I love, I love mm -hmm. that 80s synth heavy sound. Like it's just, Brian and synth work so well together. Like you listen to Love You. And, and he was like, into that stuff. Yeah, and like shortening bread and all that stuff. And it's like Brian's quirky strangeness with his arrangements and his everything like that and the, the melodies and stuff with the synth, I think just goes hand in hand. So, mm. but I um, think the, the, yeah. like the harmonic capabilities and the overtones and how, how like specific you can be with synthesis lends mm. itself really well to Brian's creativity. And it's mm -hmm. like, specificity with his arranging that you can dial in a specific frequency mm. down to the exact number whereas in the 60s he'd have to combine let's say a guitar and a piano and a Rhodes and a harpsichord in the 80s he was able to dial in patches that were yeah. maybe closer to his vision but even though yes yeah, so even though i don't understand people uh when they kind of don't like it production wise if, if they're a bit off put by it vocally i can understand um because it, it's almost like the, it's it almost seems like they purposely chose to record when brian's voice would it was at its worst because you listen to after you listen to the stuff he did after um brian wilson 88 like you listen to sweet insanity stuff recorded in like the you know like eight, eight, 80, 89 1990 stuff like that and he sounds a lot better less shrill less drug affected more smooth um and then you listen to like demos and stuff he did earlier like don't let her know she's an angel piano demo in 86 and uh stuff he did in like the early 80s like stevie and all and all that kind of stuff and he sounds a lot better on them too so it's a weird kind of he just went up and down up and down through for his vocals throughout that whole time so well, how organic do you think the making of this album was? Because obviously he was, you know, under the guidance of Eugene Landy at that time. Mm -hmm. Do you think a lot of this stuff was almost kind of forced upon him? Yeah, uh, I'd say so, yeah. yes. I think, yeah, definitely. I, and this may get some criticism, but I think uh, more than any of the, like, Joe Thomas-related projects, this album was probably the, the album where Brian was being... Uh, either coerced or popped up, you know, like held up by guys like Jeff Lynn and Andy Paley and Russ mm. Tittleman. You know, uh, there, there was a lot up, of support. You mean like, when you say held up, you mean like they were carrying it for him? Uh, maybe not as much in a writing sense, but maybe in a, a production sense, definitely, and getting it to the finish line. And mm. this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D, you know. Um, just in that there's so many names on it. And usually with Brian's music, uh, it's him and maybe another collaborator, where uh, this one you see writing and production from a whole list of incredibly talented guys. But it, it sort of lends itself to thinking that maybe he, he needed the help at the time. 
which is mm. understandable <clears throat> given the outside pressures. I mean, it, it's probably just like big part of it too is probably just like Landy, like, oh, you know, let's get as many big names on this as possible, yeah. whether we need them or not, because you listen to, you know, like Sweet Insanity, Brian wrote like all like i think every song on sweet insanity other than the lyrics brian wrote by himself like mu mm. music and stuff like that and paley sessions is just him and andy so it shows that even at that time he really didn't need all those collaborators so i feel like they were kind of being mm. thrust upon him which isn't a bad thing mm. because again they're talented but you know necessary i don't know how long was this album like in the making, like was there like a ton of like lead up to this album getting released? Uh, so uh, as as far as I know, it, they would have been getting started roughly in like '86, um, and it was probably after the the uh, Beach Boys '85. Uh, you guys ever heard the story with Steve Levine criticizing his vocal? Yeah, yeah, that's no. great. Yeah, so. Um, Brian was doing takes for I'd probably Get You Back, one of the songs on um, Beach Boys 85. And uh, the producer, Steve Levine, uh, s cut the recording and said, like, hey, Brian, you I think you're a little flat. You think you can do that again? And everyone in the room, like, gasped and looked at Steve like he just said something like foul and vile. And they said, do you, like, you know what you just said? Like, you know who you just said that to? <laughs> and Brian freaked out and, and dashed and left the studio. And Steve's thinking, like, oh, man, what did I just do? I, like, insulted, like, Brian Wilson. And um, the next day, one of Landy's people, one of Brian's assistants, uh, goes up to Steve and says, you know what you just did? And he said, what? And Brian, he said, because of you, uh, Brian's getting vocal lessons now, oh. so, uh, so you, uh, the vocal. It's funny because the vocals are a little almost more palatable on '85 than on this. Mm. But anyway, um, yeah. So there, there was definitely like writing for the songs on the album and demo recordings as early as '86. Mm. And it's funny because some of the demo recordings almost have like a a pet sounds or or you know, organic feel compared to the way they came out um which is maybe uh landy or someone in the organization sought like a commercial sound and brought in you know jeff lynn type guys to give it that clean 80s sound see with it with it kind of the whole thing starting around 86 or so it was on the tail end of um, something called the Wilson Project, which is um, which was around like 85, 86, um, where uh, Brian was working with Gary Usher, re reunited with Gary Usher, who obviously he wrote like all the car, car songs with in, 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 in the room. early 60s. Yeah. And um, yeah, so they reunited and they were like, they wrote Spirit of Rock and Roll together and like a bunch of outtakes called like Heavenly Bodies and all this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, and then Landy kind of like, kind of tried, like moved Brian away from Gary and mm -hmm. then tried to, so, so that Wilson Project stuff didn't like really get finished or, or released. Um, Most and of then, it. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. In regards to what you were saying earlier too about the, the singing and Brian's vocal stuff on this album, I think for me, one of the things that the sort of the, the vibe that I get from it is that he's definitely under distress at this point, like through yeah. the making of this album. And I feel like it's like apparent in his voice. It sounds like things like aren't completely right. And that obviously is. they weren't, I mean, with the circumstances and it's probably one of the most bizarre albums in terms of like the circumstances of how it was made, how you yeah. have this guy that's like living with this doc. Was he, is he actually a doctor? Oh, he, yeah. Was. Yeah. he was a doctor. He was a psychiatrist. Um, yeah, psychiatrist okay. yeah. So you have this guy that's living with this doctor who's basically like medicating him and like forcing to him death. to write music. I mean, is it say, is it fair to say that he forced him to write music? Yeah. Yeah. I'd, yeah, I'd definitely coerced him into doing, yeah. I mean, what other album, has ever been made under circumstances like that. It's so bizarre. 
Yeah, and is. comes out so like gorgeous with themes of humanity and love and understanding and caring. Yeah. It's it's a Hope testament right to up. his spirit that under like the darkest circumstances he could make such uplifting music. Mm. And right it, it, as is normal with uh with Brian's stuff, you know, Brian Beach Boy related stuff, quite a few of the a few of the songs on there are older. Um stuff not not recorded at the time like in in um in rio grande that night blooming jasmine she comes a creeping you know that part that's from the late 70s actually like 78 79 that that little uh melody there and then um there's so many is from the early 80s like 80 they, I think like 83, maybe 84, something like that. So, and Little Children, of course, is a love you outtake. So there's, you know, older stuff there. Teach me something every week, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. What are your guys' favorite songs on the album? I like Let It Shine. There's so many. Um, Melt Away. Mm -hmm. uh, Melt, yeah, Melt Away is like top tier like bro like almost top tier brian really if not actually like that that pro that's probably my favorite brian solo song it's just absolutely gorgeous um and then walk in the line i loved because it's one of brian's biggest bangers of his solo career it just uh, it goes so hard and i, and I love it so they're, they're probably the two favorites those are mine too my two as yeah. well so this is like the first time we've all agreed on our favorites <laughs> wow <laughs> um cool so we're going to include sweet insanity on this even though it wasn't released i mean i think it's appropriate mm -hmm. to uh mm -hmm. you know obviously discuss that as well so that was 1991 right yeah yeah so three years after that and you were saying brandon that a lot of these songs also had already been recorded mm -hmm. uh, um, even prior to the first album yeah, even prior to brian wilson 88 like don't yeah don't let her know she's an angel is from like i believe like 86 uh when he did the piano demo and uh if not like a bit earlier before he actually recorded it maybe even like the early 80s if i'm thinking correctly so um there's that and then uh obviously spirit of rock and roll is from like 86 and uh, uh what else is on there uh love ya is um taken from a brian song a demo that brian did in like 1980 1981 called sweetie uh, which has the same melody there. And then even that is based on that song, Heart and Soul. Um, so, yeah. Oh, that one, that song has a wild uh, chord change in that when it goes into that second section, it starts on like this, I think it's like an augmented chord or something because it sounds like Heart and Soul and then it goes into that second section and it gets like so wacky Darn. and dark. It's really cool. I love it. Yeah, and you, cool and also yeah. there's the two versions of Sweet Insanity. So they, they, um, first they gave version one to the record label and that, that got stupidly rejected uh and that had um a slightly different track list it was longer and it had because version two is the one that we've all listened to that is like the common one that goes around and version one had like a song called oh let's you're not a real beach boys fan if you don't have both versions yeah. of sweet insanity <laughs> let, let's stick let's stick together which is a waltz um which a, a nice waltz uh, song which got uh which got remade into the waltz on getting in over my head and has a weird owl playing accordion on the original which is pretty cool uh and then the power of love which got um redone into fairy tale on getting in over my head so yeah, yeah i prefer all of the versions uh, on this album over getting in over my head especially yeah. don't let her know she's an angel i think the production on that one is way better i really actually like the production on this album too um i yeah, probably would say i prefer it to the first album so do i so do i it yeah it to me uh, it's kind of sounds like um beach boys 85 was the introduction to like sampling and synthesizers and drum machine you know like that, that sound the 80s world brian wilson 88 refined it even more as he got more comfortable with that stuff and then Sweet Insanity refined it even more with that like 80s sound. It gets more and more like palatable and less like, oh, this is Brian trying to do an 80s song and more like something that you don't even notice. Hmm. I can't Except for Don't Let Her Know She's an Angel. 
that <laughs> super corny sounds. You're talking about on this album or in Getting In Over My Head? Uh, both for different reasons, I guess. The intro is like really uh, very like yeah. 80s on the, on the uh, getting, o- getting In Over My Head version. Is there like a flute at the beginning or something? There's like a little flute or even, solo or... Even, uh, yeah, right. Um, the bing, bing, doom, 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 the like, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, and just the chord. I mean, it's like the most 80s, just like a, a minor nine chord with like the yeah. chorus on it. It's just straight out of like an 80s movie. See, what's interesting with Sweet Insanity to me is that you, you'll go and, I mean, like, you know, you've got a lot of people that, that have listened to Sweet Insanity that really do love it. Like, I've seen people say, like, oh, you know, it's my favorite uh, Brian album, which, you know, taste because it's my favorite but uh um but then you'll have some people like you'll go on like um some beach wars forums and stuff like that or just look up some reviews of sweet insanity and people will say like oh this is really bad like um i can see why it wasn't released the production's ruin ruins it the songs just aren't there uh and like people i saw on one forum giving it like one out of five and i'm like i'm like what and I, I yeah. think that's because I think that's because um, just the Landy influence just puts them off. I think it, whether they're doing it consciously or subconsciously, they've just got Landy in the back of their mind because he was even had even more to do with this than he dad, did Brian Wilson '88 because mm. he like wrote like a majority of the lyrics on this. So people probably can't get that because I just don't understand how you can listen to this and think, oh, the songs are bad. Especially because right. if you're a Brian fan, like in my opinion, this is by far the most Brian sounding album that he's done. Like his personality and his creativity in the melodies, in the in the production is just all there. It's just in your face, Brian. So I don't understand how you couldn't like it. But yeah, yeah it would be in my top three Brian solo albums for sure. Nice. I, I was pleasantly surprised when I first heard it. What are your guys' favorite songs on this one? I like uh, Don't Let Her Know She's an Angel for sure. And uh, the spirit of rock and roll just gets me so much. It, the, the, the message of it is just so, I think it's so true. Even, even if it comes across in a, in a sort of goofy way, like that all these people will live on, you know, in their music, that definitely hits home for me. Uh, yeah, Don't Let Her Know She's an Angel is, is probably like a, a top three, maybe top two Brian uh, solo track for me. I love that. That's uh, gorgeous. Uh, also, S- Someone to Love is really fun. That's really catchy. And um, oh, and Do You Have Any Regrets is like one of Brian's best solo songs as well. I think I love that one. So. My favorite by far is, I think it actually has two titles, but it's called Brian, right? But it's also called Thank mm-hmm. You. Thank right? you, yeah. What do people typically call that one? Thank I've, you. Is, I think usually. Thank you. I love that one. That was that's my favorite one by far. Beautiful melody, beautiful chord progression, um, and just Nate. One thing about the spirit of rock and roll. I don't know if we talked about this. I, we might have, but do you know who's doing that shred guitar solo on that album? Um, no, I'm not off the top of my head. I could probably because that threw that. me off guard. Like hearing a Brian Wilson album, and then all of a sudden there's like this like Van Halen yeah. shredding. Rest in peace, Eddie Van Halen just passed away a few hours ago. We heard. About oh. That yeah oh yeah you're in australia so yeah yeah Yeah, i didn't know yeah yeah pioneer um but yeah a great album i mean i'm surprised it didn't get released like i said it's definitely one of my favorites of his solo discography i think he's got far worse (laughs) albums than this it's weird Um, because uh you sometimes i understand why um the labels didn't release things like adult child and this when when you understand that that a record label is like uh, basically an investment group and uh their only their real goal at the end of the day is to like get return on the investment and if the music gets so experimental they were you know they worry if it's relatable mm-hmm. however mm-hmm. with all that said i feel like if you're going out of the way to sign brian wilson and provide him with a budget then you would almost expect experimental, creative, you know, left field stuff. I mean, yeah, like for for one, I mean, having even like the fact that 
having Brian Wilson's name on it should be enough. Yeah, like, that's like, how I feel. Like the, the, the nerve of a record company rejecting something made by Brian Wilson, like, I know. You, you know, and they then also, the think they are. yeah. And it's like, but also I think, I think possible thing is, is that even though the, the first version that got, um, that got uh, put in was rejected, the second version, I think it's kind of like people um and are ah about whether the second version was uh, rejected as well or the reason why it didn't get released is because right right around the time they were trying to um you know get the second this version uh, that's when yeah. the Landy and Brian uh, yeah. like court stuff started happening so that might be why it didn't happen which sucks but it makes but sense because in- then he would have been making lots of money off of all that. Mm. And yeah. in regard to the experimentation too, I mean, if there's anybody that has a good track record for producing stuff when you give him the ability to experiment as much as he wants, I, don't, I can't think of a better example than Brian. Right. I mean, people regard Pet Sounds as one of the most classic albums of all time. And that was literally just him being able to do whatever he wanted, it just experiment as much as possible. And, you know, it did flop when it first came out. But I would say that with an album like this coming out in the early nineties, Brian's name has already clearly been established. People know what to expect from him. So you would think that he might be at least one person that a record company could like kind of give an exception to when it comes to that stuff. So it yeah. is surprising. Um, but great. I album mean, look, regardless. would it have done well? I mean, I kind of doubt it because it sounds like nothing like anything I've heard from the early nineties at all. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, it's a little different from Nirvana. That's for... yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you guys think about the title of the album? Sounds like oh, a landy right. thing, right? Yeah. yeah, it it really rubs me the wrong way. It sounds a little exploitive, I think. Yeah. It sounds yeah. so exploitive and and making light of something that's serious and making right. like making fun of him. You know, like it. Right. I can't picture especially... Brian deciding on that album title. Yeah, <laughs> you know. If for a guy who has a sense of humor and, and all that, like, aside, even though the way it's, like, the graphics are written and the picture of him, it all seems kind of mocking. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, um, is this album, can you get this album on vinyl? Oh, like, uh, boot, yeah, bootleg. Uh, there are, no. That's well, true, yeah. It's definitely CD bootlegs, I don't. Actually, yeah. I doubt it. I think it's, I think most of the original bootlegs that are out there are cassette and cd yeah i, I don't think i've ever seen a vinyl bootleg of it but it might exist that's somewhere gonna, that's like. gotta be a serious yeah. uh, collector's item serious for Beach Boys fan. <laughs> nice. all right you ready for uh 1995 i just wasn't made for these times mm. oh yeah 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 little detour from the previous two albums yes um, some things i like about this album some things that i don't i don't really see the need to remake these old great songs you know and i don't like any of the newer versions more than the older versions Uh, i mean Mm. the majority of this album really isn't giving you that much new music i mean how many is there only one new song well still still i dream of it is the only i mean no even then Mm. because still i dream of it was on the good vibrations box set that came out two years earlier so nothing's new Mm. on it was it the same version though like that like that's like a home yeah, no, that yeah, no, it is it is yeah. it is a different version. That's a demo version on the uh on the I, I like just, that's my favorite track on that album. I think it has yeah. a really cool sort of eerie sound to it. And I think when you think about the living conditions that Brian had in the seventies and you know what his lifestyle was like, when I hear that recording, I could just picture him just like being in his room, like wearing like a bathrobe, just like going over by the piano and just belting out some chords and coming up with you know well i guess at that point maybe the song had already been written but i feel like that the vibe of that song i completely captures like mid to late 70s brian you know Mm. yeah i mean i i i really dig dig the album as a listening experience i think uh don was did did a good job with the production uh i don't think any of the versions except maybe Love and Mercy and Melt Away improve on the originals. Um, but I don't think that was, that was their goal. Um, I think it, it was more of like a, like a tribute and a look back. Um, 
so yeah i think it's a it's a nice listening experience i think the the mostly like acoustic dialed back um arrangements make it like a really relaxing to listen to mm. and i mean again it's it, it, it's just a soundtrack album so you shouldn't take it as like oh you know why did they make this album instead of when brian could have been making you know spending his time making an album of new material because this was just a, a thing put together for the soundtrack so there obviously wasn't like heaps of uh thought or effort put into it and, it, and i mean it's harmless but it's it's something I'd never really go out of my way to listen to. Like it's, you know, mm. it's Wait, this fine, was made but... for that. This was made for that documentary. I yeah. guess it was made for. Oh, I didn't mm-hmm. even know that. Yeah. Oh wow, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but actually, I, I lied. I do like the version of Love and Mercy better on here. Actually, I prefer like the stripped down sort of acoustic version of it. Yeah. Um. But um. Good. Good. Uh. Good like uh instrumental playing on the album. He really good musicians put together for it. And it's it is just, interesting to hear Brian with like the the, the group of black like gospel singers. It's mm. it's kind of you would never never really I mean they they did it on that same song, but for the most part you'd never see it coming. But it really works on some of the songs. Well, uh, the, the thing the thing that's kind of a bit of a, a big contrast is that Brian's Brian's mid nineties voice is uh kind of going back to that late that Brian Wilson eighty eight kind of more shrill high kind of voice, but no, sounds a bit better than Brian Wilson eighty eight era. Like not not as kind of um, stressed, Tense, but it yeah. still it still sounds kind of high and drug affected. I think obviously Brian like wasn't by ninety by the mid nineties he wasn't being you know obviously wasn't being like drugged by Landy, but I think that it's just his, him kind of coming off that and his brain kind of just like trying to get back to, to normal, like trying to recuperate a bit from Landy's stuff. So, um, but it's just weird. Like when you hear like Paley session stuff, like hearing all those like really like weird creative, like Brian melodies and like a product, like zany production with like the mid nineties, like Brian shrill yelling kind of voice that fits perfectly. Cause it just adds to the weird tone. Brian singing like till I die over like an adult contemporary nineties as nineties can be uh, music kind of sounds a bit weird. Like it doesn't fit kind of gel as well, but is there a reason why they didn't just use the original Beach Boys songs for the soundtrack? Was there like an issue with the copyrights and stuff like that? Probably would have just been more expensive. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I mean, Till I Die, I mean, if there's ever a song that doesn't ever need to be re-recorded, <laughs> you know, it's that one. Yeah. Um, but interesting year for Brian. And then later on in that year, we get Orange Crate Art, which... Mm-hmm. I had I, I had never realized that all of the songs on that album were written by Van Dyke Parks. I always mm. thought it was a collaborative um, sort of effort. And I wonder if Brian still did have some input in some of the songs, because there are certain moments in those songs where you hear these these chord progressions or these these vocal harmonies. And it just sounds so much like something that Brian would would write. But I have, you know, often kind of thought of brian wilson and van dyke parks as sort of similar types of artists because obviously van dyke parks is very experimental in his own respect but there are Mm. definitely moments where it does kind of sound like it has that brian flavor to it you know yeah Yeah, definitely definitely. it's a good little album it it definitely i think is a through and through collaboration even if like van dyke's prepared the the chords and the lyrics and the parts beforehand i think by the time it got down to recording the vocals it's obvious you know there's a lot of moments where you're like a, it's pure brian mm-hmm. like harmony structures and the, the way the intervals are stacked and he did those voices one by one it's so cool like a song that i would say kind of reminds me of brian is like my ho- uh, my hobo heart mm-hmm. like just the progression and then those really interesting vocal harmonies. It just sounds like something that Brian would come up with. Yeah, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice, um, I don't know, it kind of gives me like uh, some kind of a dusk, I don't know, just the sun setting kind of, uh, 
that you'd listen to when like the sun's going down, kind of like chill, maybe sitting on like a um, a, a wooden rocking chair on the porch uh, kind of vibes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> Did you guys listen to the anniversary re-release? Yeah. Are there that's any nice. additional tracks? I've listened yeah. to the additional tracks. Yeah. There are additional tracks that weren't yeah. on the previous. Oh, I haven't listened yet. It's How does out. It, it it so at first I um just listened to it by itself and I was like, Oh, that's cool. But then when I actually sat A beat them side by side, um I I can't remember off the top of my head who who did the mastering, but you can tell a lot of love went into it. Mm. Nice, it's great. To still cat, it it sounds modern and fresh, but still has that Brian Van Dyke production aesthetic. None of that's ruined. Yeah, it's a great collaboration, and I wish they had done it sooner. I'm glad that they did it, you know, at all. But I always wish that they collaborated more in the '60s before. Brian, you know, if Brian hadn't had his nervous breakdown, you know, if they could have kept collaborating from like 67 and on, it could have been awesome because Van Dyke Parks was writing his own stuff and he released Song Cycle. And I think that album can be considered just as experimental as Pet Sounds and Smile, maybe even more in certain, maybe even more in certain regards. Um, and I always wondered what it would be like if they had combined forces back at that time when they were both kind of like at their peak of the peak of their creativity, you know. Mm. But I'm still glad that they did this, you know, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, all right, you want to go to imagination? Y yeah. yeah. If we definitely. have to, yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that bad. <laughs> so um, ever since we've been talking about it, I've just, like, dug my heels into the ground. And I, I fucking love this album. It's so goofy. Like, I, I totally understand that it's goofy. And the, the nylon string guitar fills totally make me laugh out loud. Uh, but um, the songs are just all so pretty. Like uh, the title track and Sherry and Cry and Lay Down Burden. It, it's like a very soothing album. Um, I like the, I really like the drumming. Um, I like the bass playing. I think if there's one great, results of the imagination sessions it was uh brian working with bob lizick who became his bassist ever since so definitely an asset to his career someone who can understand that like melodic playing um and i think um in a way from imagination onwards uh where like Brian does need someone to maybe kick him in the ass a little bit or help him figure out the direction. And uh, there are examples that would go against what I just said, like that lucky old son in Smile. Um, but there was like a Rolling Stone interview where he did a few years ago where he said like, I can't write a song for shit anymore. Ever. So it makes sense because he, you know, he said, I'd just be writing, trying to rewrite California Girls again. So to have like an outside producer say like, that was good or, or let's do that again or all that, um, it makes sense. But I think you can definitely hear Joe Thomas getting a little ambitious with his, his like creative fingerprints um, to the point where Brian even said that people should call it a Brian Wilson, Joe Thomas album and that he's not sure why it's called the Brian Wilson album. Um, but with that said, it's it's a great song to listen to in the car or like when you're trying to unwind. Wait, wait, which I song? Mean, Imagination. Oh, the song Imagination. Yeah, I do like that's or probably my the favorite album. Song. Oh, the album. album. Oh, okay. Song. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I, like I mean, I used to really, really dis dislike this uh this album, and I don't dislike it as much as I used to. Uh, I still don't think it's very good. I still think it's a bit of a slap in the face uh, for Brian fans, considering what we'd heard before. Um, almost like production wise, even like song wise, a lot, a couple of the songs do, but a lot of the songs don't have much of a Brian twist or feel to them at all. Like I don't listen to um, Dream Angel or Sunshine 
or something like that and think, oh, that's so Brian, you know, like, because it, it's just, mm. like, I just don't think they're very good songs. Like, they're bland. They're not, like, they don't have, like, cat, that very catchy, memorable melodies, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, and, and there are a few good songs. Happy Days, I think, is great. Mm. Um, I think that's, because that's, that's easily the most Brian feeling song on the album because you have melodies from two old Brian songs. You have um, My Solution in there and you have a bit of All This Is That in there. So that, you know, and it, it, it's a lot stranger than every other song on the album. And it has like this, and the production is like different. You've got like the, um, you know, the sax on there and it's like, oh, this is something different. So I like that. I think there's um, a couple moments of like really cool chord stuff going on. Uh, like the I love the Brian Wilson does like the descending circle progression so well and and your imagination really locks that in where it um and I also like uh cry the guitar playing and the harmonies there mm -hmm. um that one he wrote after he um had like asked Melinda for a separation um, which obviously didn't happen, but uh, she cried, and uh, because of that like experience, like he wrote that song, and you can totally feel the the emotion and the weight. God, I didn't even know that. Well, wow. yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, he uses in the vocal harmonies in like that little middle section. There's like a minor major seven chord. Yeah, um, you know what part I'm talking about? Yeah, it's wild. It's really good. Cool. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's cool. And then, like, there's another part on that, too, where I think there, it's like, I forget what key it's in, but he's doing, like, a dominant seven chord, but in the vocal part, he's singing a major seven, where he goes, do da 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 Yeah. It's like a major seven, I think, over the dominant chord. It's really interesting. I might be wrong about that if for some chance somebody's <laughs> going to check that, <laughs> but I think that might, I think that was what it was. But um, for me, like, the biggest thing with this album that turns me off I, I agree with a lot of what Brandon said. I do think a lot of the songs are kind of bland, but also the production. Like, I'm just really not crazy about the production. And you can hear it right from the start of the album with the opening, you know, part of Imagination, which is probably okay. actually my favorite song on the album. But I remember when I first heard the opening part of Imagination, it, it almost felt like a Christmas song to me. Like, I just pictured yeah. like snow and like, you know, reindeers with like bells jingling. And <laughs> it's very um, like ABC family movie. Like but it's a beautiful song. TV I mean, movie. as a song, I love the song. And like you were saying, that progression, you know, it's its almost similar to the chord progression in Love and Mercy, like that descending, yeah. you know, down the major scale. Time um, to get alone type of thing. Yeah, a oh, beautiful song. Love that song. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, I'd love to, I love, would have loved to have heard, because again, there are legit good songs on there, like Lay Down Burden, I think is good, Cry, even though I'm kind of put off, put off with the fact that like half of Cry is like a fade. It's just like the, the outro, just like when you cry, and then that just goes on for like two and a half minutes. Um, and then uh, your imagination, I do think, is, is catchy and fun, but it's like, wh where has love been? I actually kind of like as well. Yeah, thanks for saying that. I forgot about that. One. Yeah. Um, so again, which is an uh, paley... Uh, co-write which is kind of cool uh from the paleo sessions but um i just would have loved to have heard those songs in like a paley sessions with paley sessions production or even with like smile or that lucky old son kind of production like just hearing like more, more natural just more brian sound in production i think would have been great yeah, for me personally, like where we're at right now in the in the discography, like the next couple albums are kind of like my least favorite period of the Brian Wilson solo discography. I think I really gravitate towards like the beginning and the end. And then the middle part kind of gets questionable for me. Some of the choices that are made, like even another example that I forgot to say, like on this album, like just randomly like throwing on like a remake of Let Em Run Wild. I it's hate like, that. <laughs> another yeah. song though, it's just like, it's a perfect song. You, you don't ever have to redo it. Like just yeah. leave it the way it was. Like that song cannot get any better than it already is. If, um, it's, and, and if there's awkward. one song you'd expect, I feel like Brian to redo, it would probably be that one. Cause during the 
the like 93 ish when they were doing the good vibrations box set he said that he didn't like his vocal and that he sounded like a fairy uh or like a little girl i can't remember which one so it kind of kind of makes sense that he would re-record it in a lower key because so maybe he wasn't satisfied it's fu funny to me i mean that's a great vocal so brian doesn't know what the hell he's talking about but uh, <laughs> but, but but also it's funny that he he kind of like picks out that song specifically because it's like brian there's so many songs where you sing <laughs> in like your falsetto voice right. like what i know that one? why it's that so one weird. specifically what <laughs> you walk with him <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is weird. I didn't know that either. You, you guys are just loaded with fun facts. I love it. <laughs> um, all right, are we ready for the next one? Are we ready for uh, getting in over my getting head? Getting in over my head. Let, let's get oh, through yeah. it. <laughs> let's do it. Oh, I saw that bad go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, now get, getting in over my head, uh, I feel like someone needs to stick up for it a little bit because uh, – people really like shit on this one like they really like like oh this is my least favorite brian album it's trash it's this it's that and i'm like but the songs are there you know like the, the quality is there like other than brian like okay brian's vocals are probably the worst of his solo career like he he, he sounds depressed on the album honestly like there's no emotion in his voice it's just like uh, you know he's just like peak old man brian slur kind of stuff i don't like the vocals at all and they do hurt it a bit but the production it's nice like his band obviously is like doing the um the instrumentation and stuff and it's very talented band obviously and is um it's nice to hear more more natural um le less uh less shiny production after imagination i much prefer getting in over my heads uh music uh and then like you've got even though they're they're definitely lesser versions i mean don't let her know she's an angel a good song is still a good song even though it's not as well done like i still like it because it's still a great song at the end of it and like the waltz i find a lot of fun uh and uh what else uh rainbow eyes is a really nice ballad yeah, like and uh, um soul searching is great Soul Search is fantastic. So I it's the like title uh, track. Yeah, getting in over Me my too. head's gorgeous. That's uh, so, so good. So I just don't understand. Like I think people are too harsh on this album, honestly. Like it's not gr it's not like amazing. It's not great, but I think it's it's pretty decent. I've kind of always lumped this one <laughs> and Imagination sort of into the same category. Like there's de definitely some tracks that I do like, but. As an overall album, it's got a lot of kind of just skip over tracks for me. And I'm not crazy about the production. Um, but, you know, it does have some some solid tracks, you know. But I, I love the the, uh, the cover, too. I love the fact that Brian's playing bass on the cover. Me, too. That's, that's, I, I always love seeing pictures of him playing bass because I always forget that he plays bass. And then I'm just like, <laughs> oh, wait. But, I mean, when was the last time he even played bass, like, on a Beach Boys album? I actually asked On an that album? Yeah. Oh. yeah. What were you about to say? No, I was just saying, I actually, uh, on the on the Beach Boys uh, server that I'm on, I actually asked that like a week ago. I'm like, when was the last time Brian played bass on like a Beach Boys song? Uh, and the answer was, I think around 1970 was yeah. the last time. Susie Cincinnati. Like probably. Susie Cincinnati or um, the, the 1970 mm -hmm. version of Back Home. Yeah. They did. So yeah. one of those two. Because if you, you count synth, yeah. if you count like a Moog synth bass, then well into the 80s. Yeah. I've seen videos of him like uh, in the 2000s where he's doing his solo tour and he's playing bass and singing at the same time at the tour. And like, it's so bizarre to see him in a live setting playing yeah. bass and singing. Like, I feel like that was so uh, just out of the ordinary for him. Usually he's always sitting by a piano. Um, is, he, is he playing well? I don't so know. It was, they were when, doing like... Whenever he does that, um, and they they had him doing that for a good twenty years. Even when he was playing with the Beach Boys in the nineties, he'd sometimes eighties and nineties he'd sometimes do like the encore surf songs on bass. And uh, so normally they'd have like a a bassist doing like the walking melodic, real complicated lines, and then he would just be playing like the root of the chord because a lot of times um, it doesn't even look like he's playing like you see him and he's like hitting the strings with his thumb and it looks like he's barely even hitting the string yeah 
I'm I'm sure if they turned the other bass player off, it would be not much of a sound. But uh, right, you know, given yeah, that it's Brian Wilson and what a genius he is, I'm sure he can figure out the three or four notes. Um, <laughs> and he definitely knows what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, I've, I've I've analyzed so many countless hours of videos of him playing bass in the 2000s, trying to figure out if he's plugged in or not. And there's a couple of videos where he uh, like blasts the E string with his thumb and like in like in a moment of silence and you're like, oh, there he is. Oh, okay. <laughs> I always wondered the same thing about like, you know, newer uh, tours of Brian where he's sitting behind the piano. I w is he actually like playing the piano? Yeah, definitely at some points. And uh, sometimes, you know, it kind of seems like he isn't. So it could be something as simple as him turning himself up and down when as he feels but uh yeah like there's definitely documented moments and and people in the circle who who've all given the thumbs up that he's playing mm -hmm. he I wasn't guess. at first um like in 1998 and 9 during his early tours his his keyboard was like a complete prop but ever since like the smile tour he has been slowly more and more i i saw a photo <laughs> Of of the uh, I saw a photo one time and it showed the piano Brian's piano but it was like just a piano shell and it had a keyboard mm -hmm. in it which I thought was exactly. really funny. <laughs> I think uh, the white e keyboard they did it originally during C fifty and I think it's become kind of like iconic and recognizable since then because they haven't ditched it. Um, and not to get like too sad, but I, I kind of have a theory that it's sort of to block like how frail and deteriorated he looks. Um, whereas like, you know, like a Yamaha keyboard wouldn't really block his legs or anything. Like a big grand piano sort of gives, it's like a bigger security Let's blanket. Right away, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, it's a good setup for him because he's sitting behind it, but you can still see his head. You know, he's there, you can mm -hmm. see him singing, but you know, beyond that, you know, if he wants, if he feels like playing a little bit, he can. If he doesn't want to, he's got a great band behind him that's going to carry him no matter what. Hmm. And every time I've seen him, I've loved it. You know, I, I could care less what he sounds like. I could care less if he's playing piano or not. I'm just happy that he's there. You know, I just Amen. love him. All right, ready for Smile? Or Brian Wilson presents Smile? Let's do it. Same year is getting in over my head, 2004. So what is the deal with this? Because obviously he didn't, he, he shelved Smile for decades and then he performed it live. Was that before or after this album was released? Before. before. Okay. And that, so that performance, um, you've seen the documentary on that, right? Uh-huh. Oh, it's amazing. Amazing. Uh, I, being uh, Darian has got, that had to be just such a treat to just to be able to go through right? all those files and decide with Brian how you want to, you know, assemble them. I mean, just incredible but um where was i going with that i'm sorry you said this this album was released after the, the performance yes yeah, so mm -hmm. they did the performance I, I i was it in london first nate i think they mm -hmm. they did it in like 2000 was it 2003 they did it like uh, 2003 I, or something yeah i think it was 2004 Royal oh, Albert okay. Hall. 2004 and then yeah they, mccartney went right yeah exactly yeah, and then it got like a, a standing ovation. I, I love this, like everyone like obviously got like a standing ovation like the first time they did it because no shit. Uh, but then, <laughs> and then apparently that like really surprised, but like uh, you hear him in like interviews and he's like, oh, you know, people loved it and I can't believe it. And it's like, he, like he's really surprised about it. I'm like, Brian, what did, what did you think was going to happen? You know, yeah, I can't people have waited it. 30 years for it. <laughs> he killed it yeah. too. I mean, he was so nervous. You could see in the documentary yeah. I mean, he was... But then as soon as he got out there, he went into Heroes and Villains. He killed it. Oh, I love seeing how happy. Like, he's just, like, smiling, smiling the whole yeah. time. I love it. It's so, oh, it's so yeah. good. Yeah, that's an amazing <coughs> story. How yeah. that album and how, you know, revisiting it was really a hard thing for him. But, you know, he, yeah. he faced it and he got through it. And that had to be a, a transformative experience for him. And I, I think vocally on, on the album, he sounds a lot better than he does in Getting It Over My Head as well like he definitely yeah. sounds more into it which is weird because it wasn't 
obviously it wasn't that much later. It was like a year later, so you wouldn't think there'd Almost be much overlapping. Of a yeah, difference, but well, he, he sounds yeah. much better. Um, like I, I think everyone involved knew the stakes. You know, like we're working on Smile. Like this is, you know, forty years in the making. And the the attention to detail that went into every performance and the mixing and the capturing of the sound to they recorded in the same studio uh, as they did the original some of the original smile sessions and you know all the same equipment I mean it was like a labor of love to totally as close as they could get it to sound like it was recorded in the sixties which is super cool I think they really pulled it off. Other than uh, Brian's like voice giving it a real timestamp, sonically, uh, if you go flip them back and forth, they're remarkably close to the '60s mm. versions. But then the Beach Boys version of "Smile" that has all of the original recordings from the '60s, mm -hmm. right? And then what yep. was that? 2009 was that? Right? Eleven. 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 Okay. Yeah, Smile has always been a little bit confusing to me because I love it as an album, but there's so many different like versions of it. You have Smiley Smile, you have this, and then you have the Beach Boys Smile. Two dozen then, bootleg versions. Right, yeah. I, and then I had gotten that at one point. I got like the vinyl, but the whole box set where it came with like eight CDs with all these, you know, outtakes and unreleased tracks. And it kind of, you can really go down the wormhole when you get to yeah. the Smile albums. <laughs> Like I was, they have all these versions of like wonderful, like in different keys and everything. It's just wild. Some of this stuff just sounds crazy. I just got a version um, that someone had sent me that supposedly is this 1972 mix that Carl put together. Um, they could be bullshitting me, but uh, it is super weird because it incorporates a lot of the comedy skits um, actually like into the sequence of the music. Um, which I had never heard before, so uh, I can share with you guys. That's cool. That's awesome. So one other thing that I have that I'm a little confused about too, in regards to this album. So when you're watching the documentary about this, you know Darian is sitting there with Brian, and he's assembling. They're assembling the tracks and the clips together and stuff like that. But all of that is from like the '60s mm -hmm. actual recordings, right? So then that documentary wasn't really leading up to the release of Brian Wilson presents smile then, right? It was it more leading up to the beach boys smile. No, no, no it no. was leading up to the, to the 2004. Yeah. Um, they, they basically used what was recorded in the sixties as like a template. And then, you know, there were some, uh, there were some empty, empty spaces, but there was enough there, obviously, you know, five CDs worth. Um, to get a, the map drawn out, so to speak. But what's what is different about this album compared to the Beach Boys oh, Smile? Like so what this, the process, this like one, what, what, yeah. So once that once they got the sequence sorted out and they toured it, uh, and it got such great reception, uh, it you know it only made sense to to record it as an album, which I'm sure to some degree was the plan the whole time. So. Um, they got together over a matter of, of only a couple days at Sunset Sound in Los Angeles and did all the backing tracks um, in snippets, just like the way they would have done it in the 60s. Brian would have done it in the 60s with his band. And then they did the vocals. And they did it separate, just like they would have in the 60s, too. Mm. And uh, yeah, they all recorded together in... in Sunset's live room, not like overdubbing, but all playing together. So all to get that like wall of sound. Badass. So, and I guess another difference with this one has some, some newer material that Van Dyke and Brian wrote to fill in the gaps. Um, and like lyrics on top of tracks that you wouldn't have necessarily ever seen coming if you, from listening to just the Beach Boys version. Mm. Um, the, the, I guess I look at the Beach Boys version as kind of like the archival making of, and this one as like the official, this is Smile, this is my finished stamp on it. Mm. It's like they, because they did the, um, they released that, you know, the Rolling Stone uh, top 500 albums uh, list like last week or whatever. Um, redid it and, and they put um 
I put Brian Wilson Presents Smile on there. And when they did it in 2012, they had Smile Sessions instead. And then some people were like, oh, why didn't they put Smile Sessions on there? And I'm like, well, Smile Sessions isn't an album, though. It's much more appropriate for Brian Wilson to then Smile to be on there because it's an actual finished product, you know? So, that's what yeah, I think. I, it's a terrific piece of music. Uh, I think the best part is like having in, like in Blue Hawaii, having like that stuff mm -hmm. like all, all finished. And so I love that song. That is so good. Mm. What were the other Beach Boys albums that made the Rolling yeah. Stones list? Obviously, Pet Sounds. What other Pet, sa Pet Sounds at number. Pet Sounds at number two, which Pet Sounds has been at number two for God knows how long now. So it's interesting that what is that number has, one? Number one was what's, um, good, what's going what's on? What's going on? Oh wow! Nice. Game, what's going on? That's a great um, used to be Pepper, but they switched it. Yeah, Sergeant Pepper's moved to like twenty two now or something like that, which is interesting. Uh, um today today was on there as it was on the 2012 list but it's dropped from like 200 and something to 460 something which i think is a bit ridiculous how is that not in the top 10 that's such right. bullshit <laughs> yeah i mean that it barely scraping in the top 500 is ridiculous but um and wild honey made it on this time which i thought was oh, really yeah. interesting because i really like wild honey but i don't think it's worthy over other some other Beach Boys albums, you know, like Sunflower was on the 2012 one. It's not on there anymore. I think Sunflower is more deserving than Wild Honey, personally. Me too, me too. Uh, so I don't know why they, they did that, but, you know. Just, just for my own curiosity, do you, like, can you just look it up? Like, what are the top 10 on their list? I'm just curious. Yeah, I can look it up. I have to probably wrap up now. But yeah, I was going to say, as we always, can wrap up on this This album. was yeah. such a pleasure. Yes, Absolutely, good. yeah. Always love doing these. Um, I mean, yeah, you can you can head out if you want. We'll just go over this top ten thing really quick. I'm just curious about it. Awesome. But, uh, nice to hear you guys' opinions. Uh, yeah, yeah, good luck with the, uh, the the uh, Nashville thing. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. I'll yeah. go Stars and Stripes, Long Tall Texas. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> okay, so the top ten were uh, number ten was. Lauren Hill, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. I don't know anything. Oh, well, I mean, I've heard of that, but I've never uh, listened to it. I know Lauren it. Hill. I don't think I've heard that album. No. Uh, number nine was Bob Dylan, Blood on the Tracks. Hmm. Uh, number eight was uh, Purple Rain. Uh, number seven was Fleetwood Mac, Rumors. Hmm. That's a good one. Uh, six was Nirvana, Nevermind. Um, five was Abbey Road. Uh, four was Songs in the Key of Life. Nice. Stevie Wonder, yep. Yeah. Uh, three was Joni Mitchell Blue. That's classic. And then Pet Sounds and What's Going On. So it's, that's that's kind of a unexpected top ten. I thought for sure they would have Thriller and Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, I'm surprised that Abbey Road. I mean, I guess I'm not totally surprised. I would think that Revolver. Or a rubber soul. Well, uh, in um, in the 2012 list, four of the top ten were Beatles albums, and now mm -hmm. there's only one. So yeah, Revolver was in the top ten before, and I think White Album was in the top ten before as well. So, and Sergeant Pepper, obviously. So it's cool. I have to check out the whole list. I love lists. I love just like, <laughs> looking at lists and making lists, and yeah, it's fun. Yeah. All right, cool. So when we reconvene for part two, we'll have to go from uh, his the Christmas album up to No Peer yeah. Pressure. So we've yes. got like five more to cover, mm -hmm. but that was great. Got yeah, a lot of them. And uh, yeah, always appreciate these conversations. So yeah, it's great. all right. Thanks everybody for watching and we will uh, see you guys at the next episode. All see right. ya. Take Bye. care.